Tim, you're so dark this evening. I know. I put a light what on. Too. I don't know what it is. No yeah. light for you. Yeah. He's in witness protection. Ah. Understandable. Again? <laughs> Again. <clears throat> That's a good sign, Eric. <laughs> good job. Excellent. So the meeting is now live. Okay. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, good evening, everybody. It is uh, 6.02 p.m. And I'd like to welcome everybody to the Northwest Community Council for April 25th. My name is Paul Russell and I'm representing Lower Sackville. I'd like to start off by calling the meeting to order uh, and recognizing that the Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and uh, unceded lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaty signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. And as is standard with these virtual meetings, I'd like to uh, start off um, by going around the table of, of councillors and, and just making sure that our audio and video are working. Um, and so District 1, I guess it is, Councillor Daigle Gammon, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chair, colleagues, staff, and members of the public that are present. Happy to be here representing Waverly Fall River Muscadabit Valley. Good stuff, thank you. Uh, and District 13, Deputy Mayor, good evening. Howdy, how's everyone doing tonight? Great to be here. Doing well so far, let's see how that goes. Uh, District 14, no, yes, 14, uh, Councillor Blackburn, good evening. Hi, good evening, everybody. Great to see everyone. Looking forward to uh, getting down to business. Thank you. Absolutely. And uh, District 16, Councillor Outhead, good evening. Yes, good evening all from Bedford Wentworth. It is sunny, though I'm in the dark. Uh, Mr. Chair, after, I did mention, I think after the public hearing, I am going to excuse myself because we have a little family event going on, but I wanted to be here for the uh, Bedford-related public hearing. So if I disappear, don't take it personally and, and enjoy me leaving. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Councillor Othit. Please save us some cake. Um, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of March 21st, 2022. So could I have a motion to approve those minutes, please? So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Deputy Sorry. Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Outhead. Thank you very much. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all in favor of the minutes of March 22nd, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great, thank you. The next item is the approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions over to the clerk. Do we have any changes this evening? Uh, no, Chair Russell, there are no additions or deletions from the clerk's office. Okay, thank you. Can I have a motion to approve the order of business? So yeah. moved. Thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon and seconder. Second. Seconded by Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much. Are there any changes from committee? Not seeing any. All in favor of the order of business as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great. Thank you very much. We have an order of business. Business arising out of the minutes. There is none. Call for declaration of conflicts of interest. Not seeing any. Uh, motions of reconsideration, rescission, consideration of deferred matter, uh, business, and notices of tabled matters, all are none. The next item is public hearings starting, says at 6 o'clock, at 6.05 now, so we're almost there. Uh, this is item 10.1.1, uh, case 23824 on the agenda, uh, the amending development agreement and land use bylaw agreement for 123 and 185 Gary Merton Drive in Bedford. And thank you for joining us today for this virtual public hearing. The order of events for this public hearing uh, will be, uh, is it will start with a staff presentation and then the applicant will have an opportunity to present and we will finish with comments from the public hearing speakers list. As a reminder to those watching from home, uh, the deadline to register as a speaker for this hearing 
was 2 p.m. today, Monday, April 25th. There are no registered speakers for this public hearing. So first off, uh, over to the clerk, was any correspondence received for this item? Uh, no correspondence was received for item 10.11. Thank you very much, Eric. And now can we please have the uh, staff presentation? Melissa, I believe. There we are. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, I just need somebody to allow me to share my screen. You should be able to know. Right. And we can see your presentation. The floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Community Council members. My name is Melissa Evis, and I'll be presenting case 23824, which is an amending development agreement and an amendment to the land use bylaw for Bedford uh, for properties at 123 and 185 Gary Martin Drive. So the applicant is Harvey Architecture on behalf of the property owners, Northwood Care Bedford. As I mentioned, the location is 123 and 185 Gary Martin Drive and the proposal is to amend an existing agreement to allow a pedway to connect these two existing buildings. The general site location is shown on the left in red. The site is south of Sandy Lake and on the west side of the Bicentennial Highway. The boundaries, uh, the site boundaries are shown in the right, also in red. Uh, to the north is the BMO Center. Uh, to the west is a mix of uses, including some industrial, commercial, and institutional uses. To the south is vacant land, and across Gary Martin is a low-rise residential community. Uh, to the east is uh, another low-rise residential community and the Charles P. Allen High School. This is a view of the subject site looking north. The structure with the white roof is the 123 Gary Martin Drive, which is the Ivy Northwood Care Facility. And the other, uh, as indicated in the, in the photo there, is the apartment building. And this is just another view of the same sites shown uh, looking west. So this is the general planning policy framework for HRM. The regional plan and subdivision bylaw guide for population growth and investment will occur throughout the municipality. The community plan, in this case, the Bedford Municipal Planning Strategy outlines where and how different types of development may occur with certain uses only allowed to occur with further approval from council. Then we have the land use bylaw, which specifies what can be approved without going to council and seeking feedback from the public. In terms of applicable policy and zoning, the site is fully serviced by both water and sewer. Uh, both properties are zoned BWBC, which is the Bedford West Business Campus Zone, with a small portion of the 123 Gary Martin Drive zoned light industrial. Uh, both sites are within the Bedford West Secondary Plan, and the sub-designation within that plan for these properties is institutional. There is a small portion of the lands that have an industrial designation. Uh, it's outside of the the area of the building, so uh, it's, it's not of concern for this application. Um, the Bedford West Secondary Plan provides guidance for the development of a new community west of the Highway 102. The existing use of 123 is the Ivy Northwood Care Facility and 185 is a 75 unit apartment building. And the primary enabling policies are the BW32 and BW35 with consideration given to policies BW20, BW23, and BW24. So the planning process for this application began with a complete application, which was received in September of 2021. Staff provided a detailed review. Public engagement was held in November, which included a recommendation from the Northwest Planning Advisory Committee. A staff report was then drafted and the first reading was held during community council earlier this month, which brings us to today's public hearing. Uh, as for the proposal, I won't go into too much detail because I believe Steve Addison has a, a more detailed presentation, um, but this proposal is to connect the two existing buildings as shown in this diagram with a pedway. These are some elevations. They're kind of hard to read because they're construction drawings, but I know um, Councillor Russell mentioned in the last meeting, he wanted just a little bit more details on the elevations. So um, the pedway would measure 197 feet in length. On the Ivany side, the elevation from grade is approximately 16 feet. And on the apartment building side, the elevation of the pedway is approximately 19 feet. 
These are just some renderings of the Pedway. Uh, on the right is the exterior and on the left is what the interior could potentially look like. These are just to give you an idea of what the type of structure that's being proposed. Our enabling policies are as follows. Uh, policy BW20, this one establishes sub areas within the Bedford West Plain area. Uh, policy BW23 establishes the land use designations. In this case, as I've mentioned, the lands have been designated institutional. Uh, policy BW24 allows council to consider variations to the standards of the land use bylaw for the Bedford West area. Uh, and policy BW32 provides guidance on residential development, including building design. BW35 allows council to consider residential development on the lands designated as institutional. Uh, staff have reviewed the proposal against these policies and have found the proposed pedway to be consistent with the policy intent. In terms of public engagement, consultation included a mail out, uh, which was to 388 people, a newspaper ad, and a virtual uh, public information meeting. The meeting was to be held on November 30th, uh, 2021, but we didn't have any participants, uh, so there's no meeting notes uh, were generated. One email was received with questions on blasting, uh, which was not required for the proposal, so um, that was about all the questions we received. Uh, we then went to PAC on December 8th, 2021. Um, they considered the proposal and recommended approval of the application as presented. So the staff recommendation uh, is that Northwest Community Council adopt the amendment to the land use bylaw for Bedford as set in attachment A and approve the proposed amending development agreement, which shall be substantially formed set in attachment B. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. We can still see your screen. Thank you. There we go. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to open up the floor to councillors. Do we have any questions of clarification for Melissa? If you would like to ask any questions, please uh, indicate that in the chat. And I don't see any questions of clarification being asked for. So I'd like to open the public hearing. And at this point, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Steve Addison and Janet uh, Sim. Are you both with us? I see Steve and Janet in the meeting and there's Janet on the screen. Steve, are you with us as well? I'm here, yep. Beautiful, okay. You have 10 minutes uh, to make a presentation. Uh, go ahead, the floor is yours. Okay, I believe you have the presentation there. Somebody's going to play it for me. Perfect. And the first slide is up, go ahead. All right, uh, so this is case 23824, um, amending the development agreement for 123 and 185 Gary Martin Drive. Next slide, please. Um, Melissa went over most of this in her uh, presentation, but I'll give a brief uh, project overview here. Um, the objective uh, of the proposed amendment is to permit the construction of a pedway connecting the existing buildings located on the above mentioned properties. The interconnection of the existing facilities, the 173 unit multi unit residential building and adjacent 155 bed long term facility. Uh, this connection would be by way of uh, an enclosed pedway, a portion of which would be elevated, and uh, it it would be uh, constructed in order to foster and encourage safe interaction between residents of the two facilities. Um, interconnection would provide all weather connectivity, ability for residents to co-mingle, um, assisting in volunteerism, provide better access to social programming and services, and uh, reduction of social isolation. Next slide, please. Um, as Melissa outlined, uh, we uh, have developed a design rationale to respond to uh, the bylaws of the area, um, specifically BW20, BW23, and BW24. BW20, um, the amendment uh, to include 123 Gar Gary Martin Drive under the existing development agreement for 185 Gary Martin Drive shall include provisions for all new development intended within the sub area. The sub area being sub area three on schedule BW6 of the municipal planning strategy. 
Uh, in response to BW23, the proposed pedway that will connect the two buildings located on 185 and 123 Gary Martin Drive will adhere to the framework of the community concept plan as shown on schedule BW7. The objectives of the development district will be incorporated into the proposed amendment to the development agreement already in place for 185 Gary Martin Drive. Uh, the development district being residential neighborhoods. Um, the proposed pedway seeks to have consideration given to varying the development standards established under the Bedford Municipal Planning Strategy and Land Use Bylaw. Specifically, the standard uh, standards pertaining to lot coverage and setbacks, whereas this pedway will have to cross the, um, uh, the lot lines, obviously. So the various variation requested through this proposed amendment will be allowed to, uh, will be to allow lot coverage and setback re requirements to facilitate that pedway to cross over the property line between 185 and 123 Gary Martin Drive. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'll now just go over the objectives of the neighborhood district um, that we've responded to in uh, in our development of the design note for this project. Um, so uh, one of the first object objective being to plan neighborhood development on a comprehensive basis. The plan to consolidate some building facilities in one building for shared use of another building demonstrates a comprehensive approach to development of the two adjacent sites. Uh, the next objective is to support the and integrate housing opportunities for a variety of income levels, lifestyle, and age groups. Connecting the two types of senior facilities will allow for more integration of residents with a variety of income levels, lifestyles, and age groups. Um, to preserve, uh, the next objective is to preserve natural drainage systems. Oh. We just lost your screen. Yep, I'm sorry, I'm not in control of the screen. My apologies, Chair, that was uh, on our end. We're getting it back up just this second. Thank you. And I have paused the timer just while we're waiting for the uh, screen to come back up. Sorry, I didn't realize my camera was off that, uh, that whole time. All good. Here we are, thank you, go ahead. Perfect, yeah, I think we left off on objective um, to preserve natural drainage systems and areas of unique sensitive terrain and vegetation and to encourage development designed to suit the natural terrain and reduce negative impacts on the natural environment. In response to this objective, uh, the majority of the proposed pedway structure will be elevated above the ground, al uh, allowing for uninterrupted landscape and open space below. The structure of elevated the structure of the elevated portion of the pedway will require only one concrete foundation and steel pier for um, to support it, uh, therefore touching the landscape uh, relatively lightly. Um, the next objective is to encourage innovative design with within clearly defined performance criterion. The Innovative design of the Pedway will uh, Pedway has been developed on the performance criteria of safety, weather protection, and efficient consolidation of visit, building facilities and services. Next slide, please. Um, continuing with the objectives, uh, the next one is to provide attractive, comfortable, and convenient routes for pedestrians and cyclists that cannot that connect with the community trail system, local commercial and community facilities, and public transit stops. The proposed pedway will provide attractive, comf comfortable, and convenient routes for the, the pedestrians to pass between the two buildings and allow for connection to shared facilities. Uh, with many residents having mobility issues and compromised immune systems, the pedway will provide a crucial means of independent movement uh, critical to physical and mental health. Um, a resting alcove has been incorporated into the design of the pedway. Uh, this would provide a resting place with for residents with uh, physical challenges, as well as uh, provide a, a, a kind of stopping place that would foster interaction in an otherwise uh, structure designed to just convey people between the two buildings. Um, there'll be, uh, there was a previous uh, rendering that we saw of that alcove, we can 
go back if you wanted to see that. If you want to go just back to slide four, if that's possible. Yes, so the bottom left-hand corner is that alcove there. And you can go back to slide five now, thank you. Uh, the next, next objective is to foster individual neighborhood identities with attractive streetscapes and uh, distinctive architectural landscape themes. The Pedway will offer a distinctive architectural element that will contribute to the identity of the site within the neighborhood fabric. Planned landscape schemes surrounding the proposed Pedway will foster a cohesive connection and identity of place between the two buildings. Next slide, please. Uh, the last two objectives are uh, to provide an uh, effective integration with established neighborhoods and to provide for adequate buffers from abutting commercial industrial developments. The proposed pedway and surrounding landscape design that you can see to, in the image to the right there um, uh, Sorry, the building lots offer a connection without the connection of the pedway and surrounding landscape. The area between the buildings will remain in uh, unanimated space. The pedway, pedway and surrounding landscape design will offer a buffer between the adjacent industrial park and the residential neighborhoods. So just to kind of the north of this image, there is more industrial uses. So the landscape design will uh, offer a buffer to that type of uh, use. Um, the last objective is to provide neighborhood parks at convenient locations that are comfortable, visible, and conform with the principles of crime prevention through environmental design, CPTED. Um, there has been a landscape architect working on the design. This landscape uh, design uh, was not from our office, but uh, the proposed design um, surrounding the Pedway will provide a convenient and comf comfortable park-like environment that will be visible to the surrounding neighborhood, inviting social interaction. Um, measures will be provided to deter crime through the principles of CPTED. Uh, and then the next uh, slide, please. Uh, just uh, some blown up images of the renderings that we had shown previously, this one being an aerial view uh, taken from the um, uh, Ivany Place side looking towards the newer apartment building. Next slide, please. Uh, this ped is just showing the landscape uh, that can uh, continue underneath the elevated portion of the pedway. Next slide. Again, that uh, internal uh, um, alcove that's been uh, created in the pedway to, to provide a resting area as well as kind of a seating area. Next slide. And finally, the landscape design that incorporates uh, some some aspects of a of um, an amphitheater uh, ramp as well as some outdoor patio space and and planting. And that is all for my presentation. Um, Janet is uh, on the call as well, and uh, I'll I'll offer her the opportunity to make uh, any comments she wishes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think you did a great job, Steve. Uh, for us, it's about attaching a long-term care facility to an affordable seniors housing. Each building was designed to complement one another in the affordable senior, seniors housing. We have a community center at the base. In the long-term care facility, we have great room. We have OT, physio. Uh, so not duplicating any of those services, uh, but being able to share it and doing that in a safe way, as Steve had mentioned with that enclosed pedway. The pedway will also offer an opening so that individuals who live in the apartment building as well as the um, uh, long-term care facility will be able to access the gardens, which our foundation is supporting us in developing an outdoor kitchen area and uh, an amphitheater. Um, our goal is to create a community within a community um, so that people feel like uh, they have, um, they own a piece of the world and they still belong, not just to the Northwood community because we also welcome our sur surrounding community. It's such a critical asset and it's a model, model that has served as well in Halifax for over 50 years. So we're, we're trying to replicate that in, in Bedford with a different type of culture. This one is instead of an urban setting, this is uh, certainly has uh, more green space and uh, community gardens, all those types of things that we uh, uh, believe are unique to this campus. Thank you very much, uh, Janet. And thank you, Steve. Uh, Janet, it's great to see you again. Uh, very, thank we you, met, you. you know, a number of years ago. Um, at this point, I'd like to, uh, let me see now, normally any member of the public who has registered with the clerk's office on this matter 
would be given five minutes to address the topic. However, there were no speakers that were registered to uh, this public hearing. I'm wondering, um, at this point, I, I'd like to reach out to council and see if there are any questions of clarification of council from the presenters. And I don't see any. Okay, so can I please have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Second. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. And now, what are the wishes of council? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to put a motion on the floor if that would be helpful. Uh, that would be helpful. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Ruffett. All right, I'm going to move that uh, Northwest Community Council one adopt the amendment to the land use bylaw for Bedford as set out in attachment A of the staff report, dated March the fifteenth, twenty twenty two. Two approve the proposed amended development agreement, um, which shall. Excuse me. Hi, Roxanne. I sorry through the chair uh, for this particular item. We're only going to move the first recommendation, and then once the land use bylaw amendment is adopted and in place, then council will come back and uh, deal with uh, item two and three for the development agreement. But the uh, the LUB amendment has to be done first. Uh, okay, okay. So you want me to just to do uh, item number one then? That's correct, yes. All right, thank you, sir, for that. Okay, so I'm going to move the Northwest Community Council. Sorry, can I just interrupt for one? Sorry, I'm just going to, I just need a clarification from uh, Roxanne. Yeah. Um, the land use bylaw is not, um, the DA is not contingent on the land use bylaw amendment. So I don't know if you need to move them separately. I think it's not, not, yeah, I don't know. You would have gotten perhaps some legal advice on this from, um, uh, from Meg McDonald or McDougal, sorry, Meg McDougal. She didn't speak to that. She didn't speak okay. to um, moving them separately. Um, the land use bylaw amendment doesn't enable the DA in any way. The DA already exists. I know the DA already exists, but does the amendment to the land use bylaw need to be in place in order for the DA to um, amend to allow it for a zero setback? So the bylaw needs to be amended for the uh, to reduce the setback. So then that that can be referenced in the development agreement because the no. the, um, the the amendment to the land use bylaw can be appealed. So if it's not necessary, then I'm, I'm not really clear why we're here amending the land use bylaw if it's not required for the DA. So the land use bylaw applies to 123 and the DA only applies to 185. Okay. So they're two separate um, properties, two separate, um, like one has a DA and one has a zone. And they're not okay, they're not super. All right, understand that now. So go ahead with, uh, with two and three. That wasn't uh, completely clear to me, but thanks for that clarification. We're thank all good you. then. Great. Thank, thank you, Melissa, and thank you, Roxanne. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Ophit, with the full motion as is in the I agenda. Am, I'm going to remember this day. I was right. I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to move that Northwest Community Council one adopt the amendment to the land use bylaw for Bedford to set out attachment A of the state of the uh, staff report dated March 15th, 2022. Two approve the proposed amending development agreement, which shall be substantially of the same form as set out in attachment B of the staff report dated March 15th, 2022. And three require that the agreement be signed by the property owner within 240 days or any extension thereof granted by council on the request of the property owner from the date of final approval by council and any date of final approval by council and any other bodies if necessary, including applicable appeal periods, which is later otherwise, uh, this approval will be void and obligations arising here under shall be at an end. So moved. I'll Thank you, Councillor Othet. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Othet. And, uh, and listen, th I'm glad actually that uh, we had that discussion. So we, we get this done right. So we didn't have to come back and do it again. So thank you, uh, Solicitor and Melissa for clarifying this. I'm very happy to bring this forward. As I mentioned, I was uh, around uh, when the first sod was turned uh, for this uh, campus many years ago. And I know Gary, I knew Gary Martin well, and I knew, and I know his family. And uh, 
I think he'd be very pleased to see something of this uh, this mm. quality and this value on uh, on the street that was uh, named after him. And of course, as as Janet said, this uh, this overall complex has been so integrated with the community, be it with uh, community gardens, be it with Christmas tree lightings, be it with uh, gyms that are available to people in the community and whatnot. It's just been a wonderful experience that I've been so pleased to be uh, a part of in a very small way but uh, so I'm very happy to bring this uh, forward I think this is a great uh, way I've been in these buildings and having them uh, connected uh, for folks I think it's just a, it's just a wonderful thing and uh, I really can't think of anything else to say other than I'd love your support on this and this is a good thing and a good day thank you very much Councillor Uh I don't see any further requests for Comment or a question, are we ready for the question? Question. Question. The question's been called. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great, thank you very much. That passes. The next item on the agenda is variance appeal hearings and there are none. Uh, next we have correspondence. Over to the clerk, do we have any correspondence? And you are muted, Eric. No correspondence was received for this meeting. Okay, thank you very much. And petitions? No petitions were received for this meeting. Okay, thank you very much. And I don't see any petitions from council. And we don't have any presentations. There are no information items brought forward. So the next item on the agenda is 12.1.1, the 2022 District Boundary Review. Uh, this is a presentation by Liam McSween, um, and there's Liam. So for today's uh, Northwest Community Council meeting, one speaker signed up by the deadline. Um, as a reminder to those watching from home, the deadline to register as a speaker for this hearing was 2 p.m. today, Monday, April 25th. Um, Liam, I believe you have a presentation for us this evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I do. Uh, I was having some difficulty sharing it uh, on Zoom, so I'm going to ask uh, the, the uh, clerk there to uh, bring it up. And uh, I believe Ian's going to actually start us off here. Thank you very much. And we can see the presentation now. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, I, I want to provide a sincere th thank you for having Liam and I here today at your community council meeting uh, to discuss the district boundary review. <clears throat> this process has been adopted by executive committee uh, as a way to engage with the public on phase one of the Halifax Region Municipalities District Boundary Review. We have pre prepared a presentation for you today that speaks specifically to phase one. And again, I do want to say thank you for, for having us on your agenda today. Next slide, please. Determine the size of regional council involves the consideration of the desired style of council that, that council wants to employ. This includes a determination on the effective and efficient number of councillors representing Halifax Regional Council. The style of government is a question which should be decided by council through adequate public consultation and look at the expectations of its residents. The size of council and its governance structure is a matter which can then be determined by regional council in an informed debate. Phase one, which we are here to discuss today, will require council to consider the desired number of polling districts within the HRM. This process goes into the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. They have indicated that this process of phase one should consider effective political management, effective representation, as well as accountability. For the 2022 review, Regional Council has designated an Executive Standing Committee to undertake, part, to undertake the review. The role of Executive Standing Committee for Phase 1 specifically is advising on the strengths, challenges, and opportunities of the existing governance model for Regional Council, provide direction and confirmation on the public engagement activities, as well as required information for evaluation for Regional Council, participate in the public engagement sessions when required, receive what we heard um, what we heard report recommendations on phase one of the public engagement and provide feedback prior to formal submission for regional council and finally provide a recommendation based on the public consultation to regional council on the recommended number of polling districts on or before june 14th 2022 
And that's what brings us here today. Uh, Liam will go over the phase one review very, very quickly. Uh, I just wanna make sure that we're providing what we're here to actually discuss. Uh, next slide, please. As most of you are aware, phase two of this review is happening as well. Phase one looks at the specific number of districts around the, um, in, the in the Halifax Regional Municipality, whereas phase two will look at specifically the distribution and borders of those districts. On February 8th, 2022, Halifax Regional Council approved Administrative Order 2022001, creating the first district boundary resident review panel. This panel is responsible for making recommendations on adjusting boundaries for the submission to the NSCERB. This process is in flight and is occurring as we speak, but phase one is happening first and will be happening to influence and provide direction for phase two. Uh, the conversation today is specific to phase one and we will be looking at returning on phase two, looking at the actual boundaries. Uh, I'll now pass it over to Liam McSween who will go over some of the aspects of the review. Thank you very much, Ian, and uh, next slide, please. So uh, the aspects of the review uh, focus on matters that are within the jurisdiction of the Uni uh, Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board uh, under the current legislative framework. So the district boundary application to the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board should reflect existing legislation and not assume any future amendments. The public engagement process for phase one of the district boundary review should focus on changes with respect to the size of council and the governance structure permitted under the current legislative framework. During this review, there may be governance aspects identified uh, that are not in the jurisdiction of the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. Um, the NSURB does not have the jurisdiction to amend legislation that rests with the provincial that rests with the provincial legislature of Nova Scotia, uh, and this includes uh, you know amendments to the HRM Charter, the Municipal Elections Act, and the Municipal Government Act. Uh, so things um, that have been identified in the past, such as voter eligibility and councillor nomination requirements, um, have, have come up uh, along with uh, things like uh, designated seats and uh, lowering uh, the age of uh, voting. Uh, those are all things that have, uh, have been talked about before and have been brought up uh, during various uh, governance reviews and, and um, public engagement. So uh, the uh, only one that uh, council has really taken any action on, uh, in, in this case has taken a defined action on, uh, is um, with respect to uh, including permanent residents on the list of electors and allowing permanent residents to run as candidates in municipal elections. A formal request for legislative amendments to the Municipal Elections Act was approved by a motion of council on December 2nd, 2014. Um, at this time, the province uh, had indicated it viewed the ability to vote as inseparable from the ability to nominate candidates and run in elections. The question of permanent resident voting was considered at various stages, and an administrative review of the elections process took place uh, from February to May of 2019. Although there were several discussions, uh, the Municipal Elections Review Advisory Committee did not recommend amendments to the Municipal Elections Act uh, or to allow permanent residents to vote. Uh, and nominate and run. Uh, the committee pointed out that it would require significant revisions uh, to other sections of the, um, pardon me, of the Municipal Act, uh, Elections Act at this time to allow permanent residents to vote, nominate and run. Um, so uh, it's still with the province at this time. Um, we fully intend as part of uh, this uh, public engagement activity, for both for phases one and two, uh, that we're going to hear from the public on uh, some of these items that are outside of uh, the scope or the current legislative framework of, uh, of the district boundary review. Um, we have a plan to document all of those um, matters as they come up and uh, provide council with an action plan or a report or a path forward for some of these uh, items that may require legislative amendments in the future. Next slide, please. So uh, just a little bit of background um, on uh, council. Uh, Halifax Regional Council serves as the decision-making body for the Halifax Regional Municipality. The council is comprised of 16 councillors who represent 16 electoral districts and one mayor who's elected at large and is governed by the HRM Charter. Uh, sections 8 and 9 of the HRM Charter established the minimum requirements for the size of council and representation for each polling district. Section 8 uh, reads the municipality is governed by a council consisting of at least three members and one councillor shall be elected for each polling district in the municipality. Uh, similar for the election of mayor, uh, the mayor shall be elected at large 
and every person eligible to vote for a counselor is eligible to vote for mayor. And since 2012, uh, the Halifax Regional Municipality has been comprised of 16 electoral districts represented by 16 councillors and a mayor. Uh, next slide, please. This slide uh, shows a uh, overview of the current governance structure. Uh, so you can see Halifax Regional Council there at the top. There are four community council and six uh, community councils. Uh, we're at one of them tonight and, a, and, a, and six standing committees, uh, which feed recommendations up to uh, community council. Um, so uh, administrative order 48 respecting the creation of community councils has delegated certain authorities to community council in accordance with sections 30 and 31 of the HRM charter. And this includes the ability to hear variants of appeals and site plan appeals, approve development agreements and amendments to development agreements where applicable municipal planning strategy provides for it, and amend land use bylaw if the uh, amendment carries out the intent of the municipal planning strategy. The HRM Charter gives council the community council the, the discretion on how it conducts its affairs, including granted, uh, granting council the authority to establish community councils, standing committees, and advisory committees and assign certain duties to them. So the HRM Charter gives council that discretion, sorry. Section 21 of the HRM Charter gives council the ability to create standing committees and special advisory committees. In 2012, Halifax Regional Council created a standing committee system and a reporting structure for each of its associated advisory committees. The standing committee structure was adopted out of several govern governance reviews dating back to the amalgamation of the former municipal units of Dartmouth, Bedford, Halifax, and Halifax County in 1996. In moving to a standing committee structure, Council cited the need to reduce the number and complexity of advisory committees, improve the efficiency and effectiveness of Council decision making, bring strategic focus to well-defined policy and program areas, fill in policy development gaps, and provide accountability and oversight to advisory committees. Their main objective is to monitor current program delivery, service levels, emerging issues, recommending policy and program changes to Council, and providing a forum for public participation. Um, so uh, there are six standing committees, and actually, uh, th there are uh, there's uh, if you count uh, the budget committee, uh, uh, there's seven, uh, which uh, meets as required uh, budget committee uh, of the uh, committee of the whole standing committee on budget. And under that, uh, you see advisory boards and committees and commissions, which report up through those uh, community councils and standing committees, and they are comprised of residents, community groups, nonprofit businesses, etc., folks from uh, uh, and provide advice uh, to um, community council, standing committees and council. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, currently, there are uh, four community councils, each consisting of five to six districts. Harbor East Marine Drive uh, comprised of districts two, three, four, five and six. Halifax and West uh, comprising of electoral districts seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 and 12. Northwest uh, comprising, uh, comprised of districts one, 13, 14, 15 and 16 and Regional Center Community Council, which meets as required for the uh, center plan areas, District 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit more on community councils and their roles and authority. Uh, they consider development variances and site plan approvals, uh, consider development agreements, hold public hearings, consider amendments to land use bylaws, advise council on municipal planning strategy amendments, Recommend to council expenditures to be financed by area rates, establish advisory committees, make councillor appointments to standing committees, make recommendations to council on public appointments. Uh, and there is new legislation being proposed, Bill 137, which may have an impact on uh, the recommendation on some planning advisory decisions. Next slide, please. Uh, standing committees, uh, as stated in 2012, Halifax Regional Council created standing committees to examine specific issues, outlines in their terms of reference. Uh, there are six standing committees. Um, the appeals, uh, which is a decision-making body, uh, it has the final say on appeals and dangerous and unsightly premises. Uh, audit and Finance Standing Committee, Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee, Environment and Sustainability, Transportation, Executive, and uh, the Committee of the Whole on Budget, uh, which meets as required. Uh, standing committees provide recommendations, except for appeals and advice to uh, council on specific matters. They can request staff reports in accordance with the terms of reference and are the primary form for public input. Advisory boards and committees, uh, our HRM boards and committees are groups consisting of councillors, residents and subject matter experts that provide advice and recommendations to council on certain matters within their terms of reference. Uh, they have a specific terms of reference that guide the work that they do. 
Uh, and this is an opportunity for, for many people uh, from across the municipality to uh, volunteer and provide uh, that level of public input into the decision-making process for uh, Halifax, uh, for the Halifax Regional Municipality. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And uh, next slide, please. There we go. So with respect to population growth, um, population growth uh, will influence the boundary review process, both for phase and one, uh, phase one and phase two, uh, now and in future years. Uh, increases in population do not happen equally across the HRM. Uh, so that's a point that uh, we, we do want to make. Uh, the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board requires relative parity uh, of power of a relative parity of voting power. Uh, and that means that uh, all districts have roughly the same number of electors so that each vote carries the same weight. Um, so the variance that's set by the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board is plus or minus 10%. So that's kind of the, the magic number when we, when we look at the uh, Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board requirements and those five requirements that Ian had mentioned earlier. Um, there is an opportunity for up to plus or minus 25% voter parity. But the higher the deviation, the more justification is required uh, for that. So um, that the, the relative parity of voting power is, is a pretty important component of um, phase one and phase two to ensure that uh, those electors um, carry the same weight in each district and recognizing full well that population doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't happen equally across HRM. So that's one of the, one of the aspects of, of this review. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a, a little bit of information on the current population number of electors. Um, so at the time of the 2010 review, HRM's total population was uh, 372,679. Uh, this shows that since 2010, uh, the HRM has grown by 70,410 residents to a total of 443,089. I support that this information uh, was compiled using data from the 2016 census. Uh, so due to the timing of the federal census release, uh, the 2021 census data is still being assessed by staff to determine the district by district comparison. So an, an up to date district by district comparison uh, with the current population and the number of electors. Uh, this uh, staff will present updated numbers, uh, which incorporates this information once they've been made available from Statistics Canada. We're still waiting for that uh, dump. It's supposed to be happening, uh, that data dump that's supposed to be happening very, very shortly, uh, either within the last week of April or in very early May. Um, so we will certainly have that information available when we move into phase two, especially. So the, the numbers that you see and you, you will see in the next couple of slides are, uh, are projections based on the 2016 census numbers. In terms of uh, general population data, uh, as of 2021, the Halifax Regional Municipality is in the top six of the 25 largest municipalities in Canada, with a 9.1% population growth rate from 2016 to 2021. Downtown Halifax's population is the fastest growing in Canada, 26.1%. Population growth will influence the boundary review process and needs to be factored in within the public ag engagement activities um, for both phases one and two. And uh, mem members of the public must clearly understand that the number of residents and electors in each district to provide an, inform an informed opinion on how effectively they're being represented and if changes to the size of council should be considered. Next slide, please. So this slide gives you a breakdown of the number of electors and population in each electoral district. So uh, you've got your electoral district, the population, the current number of electors, and, and the projected number of electors by 2024. The number of electors is, is important uh, for the boundary review. This is one of the factors that the Nova Scotia Utility and Review looks at uh, specifically, not population. So, uh, But uh, we do feel it's important to have those population numbers uh, in there as well too, to provide a, an overall picture of, uh, of representation. Um, next slide, please. And this is just a continuation of that uh, graph, and you can see the uh, see the averages and totals at the bottom there. Uh, with respect to comparator municipalities, um, staff have prepared demographic uh, additional demographic information related to phase one of the review, and the scan utilizes census uh, data from 2021. Um, and includes information such as popul the population of each Canadian municipality, the number of councillors and electoral districts that are represented in each of these jurisdictions, um, and changes in population growth, growth from 2016 to 2021. So right there in this slide, you can see uh, uh, some of the comparator uh, cities uh, or jurisdictions, Winnipeg, uh, the city of Hamilton, 
Quebec sorry, City. Sorry, Liam, we will need the next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> next slide, please. And hopefully that one's up. My apologies. Getting ahead of myself here. Thank you very much. Uh, and yes, so so uh, you can now see <laughs> the, the the comparator municipalities there, um, the Halifax Regional Municipality being bolded, and some of the uh, jurisdictions such as Winnipeg, City of Hamilton, Quebec City, uh, Laval, London, Gatineau, and Saskatoon. Next slide, please. Uh, so with respect to the population summary, on average, and this is an average, HRM's councillors represent 27,693 residents and, 2020, and 22,406 electors per district. By 2024, the number of electors are projected to grow to 378,948 or 23,648 per district. And that's on average. Uh, it wouldn't be the same in, in, in each district, but uh, that's an that's a average across the board. Next slide, please. And I'm going to turn this one over to Ian. Thank you, Liam. So Liam has one more slide and then we will we'll open it up for some questions. But uh, what we are what we're ultimately here today is, is to look at the next two slides to provide some key considerations. Uh, you will note that in Liam's presentation, there was a lot of background information, a lot of, of educational information provided. That is one of the main um, recommendations that came from the Nova Scotia Utility Review Board when this process happened the last time, was to look at education as well as engagement when we were looking at the district boundary review. So you will note that a lot of that information was provided to try to provide information on what representation happens in, within the Halifax Regional Municipality uh, before people engage on if it is effective or not. Uh, what we are looking through in phase one, and, and Liam will go over some of the further and, and upcoming and ongoing engagement opportunities for, for everyone, is looking at the current governance structure and looking at the accessibility of residents and the ability for councillors to make decisions. Uh, we've compiled a survey and a number of other items that Liam will, will discuss, and those are all effectively looking to answer some of these questions for executive committee and ultimately a regional council submission to the Nova Scotia Utility Review Board for phase one and phase two of the district boundary review. Um, next slide, please. Another main factor we are looking for is, is and looking to hear on is whether this representation is, is effective and whether residents believe that this representation is working for them. These will all be provided to the executive committee and through regional council. Uh, and Liam will talk about the upcoming and the ongoing engagement activities that we're looking at for the, for the rest of phase one of the review. Excellent, thank you very much. Next slide, please. And next slide, uh, please. That's wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, so um, there's um, ways that, that uh, the public can uh, maintain engagement uh, within this process for phase one. Um, there, the public engagement survey uh, conducted by Narrative uh, Research provides background information on the services provided by the municipality, council's governance structure, and the current number of councillors and the number of refer uh, residents represented in each electoral district. It's designed to gain measurable data with respect to the level of resident knowledge with uh, municipal services and their experiences interacting with council, community councils, and committees. The survey seeks specific feedback from the public on the appropriate size of council and how many residents should be represented by an elected official within a given electoral district. The data collected from the survey will inform the What We Heard report and will provide the Executive Standing Committee with insight from the public when considering its recommendation to Regional Council on the size and governance structure for, uh, for Halifax Regional Council, uh, which uh, will, will uh, be before the Executive Can Standing Committee in May. Um, this is being uh, conducted by Narrative Research, who have spe uh, specialized expertise in developing public engagement surveys and analyzing the data that is collected. The survey is running concurrently with uh, these public participation meetings being hosted by HRM's Community Council. Uh, secondly, uh, there, of course, are the, pub, uh, the public participation meetings being hosted by Community Council. Um, and these uh, have been taking uh, place over the month of April. Um, it is important to note that members of the public are able to attend any meeting of uh, Community Council, not just the one being held in their district. Um, they're being held, uh, we, there was one uh, in-person meeting at Harbour East Marine Drive Community Council with the rest being held virtually. 
uh, and the information provided at these meetings will be recorded through meeting minutes and captured uh, by uh, the external public engagement specialists to be included in the what we heard report and that would be narrative research Uh, there are, uh, along with this, uh, the, and some of you have, uh, and I think all of you have uh, been able to at least uh, provide a time to, to provide an interview uh, with narrative research. Um, they're reaching out to counselors specifically to determine their sp uh, perspective and experiences as members of regional council relative to the current size, of uh, size and governance of Halifax Regional Council. Uh, members of the public are still able to correspond, as always, uh, provide their, their written thoughts and opinions on uh, phase one uh, of the district uh, boundary review, uh, and that can be submitted through the municipal clerk's office, um, uh, and the correspondence will be collected uh, by emailing clerks at halifax.ca or, or uh, sending our regular um, uh, mail. Uh, and processed by municipal clerk staff and brought forward to the uh, executive standing committee. This information, uh, any correspondence received, will also be provided to narrative research to include in uh, their analysis. Uh, upon completion of the public engagement activities related to phase one of the district boundary review in April 2022, uh, with the assistance of narrative research, the What We Heard report will be developed and submitted to the Executive Standing Committee for its consideration and recommendation to Halifax Regional Council at its May 30th meeting. Uh, staff are proposing that this meeting at the executive standing, uh, this meeting of the executive standing committee be open to all members of the regional council to participate in that discussion uh, before the phase one recommendation is forwarded to regional council and that the uh, committee of the whole rules will uh, apply to the debate on the matter. Um, uh, people uh, who are interested, uh, members of the public, uh, will certainly be able to pr uh, provide their comments at public participation, uh, which at the executive standing committee for their April and May meetings. Um, and um, it uh, has that public uh, uh, participation component at uh, each of its regular meeting agendas. And uh, we're just certainly uh, uh, looking forward to anybody who may want to come out and engage with the executive directly on this matter. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll go to the next slide and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. And just thank you very much for, for listening to our presentation tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Ian and Liam, for the presentation. It provided a ton of good information. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to uh, open the floor for questions to, uh, or rather from councillors. Um, if you would like to ask something, then uh, please signify that in the chat. And go ahead, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much, Liam, for uh, the presentation. This was uh, this was awesome. Uh, I guess the the only thing that I would uh, probably ask is the, the slide that had the comparators. And I'm just wondering um, if, that, if that slide has enough information so you can make a true apples to apples comparison, because I'm thinking, you know, it, it, it might be uh, fine to see that, say, Gatineau has 10 councillors and each one of those councillors looks after 35,000 people. But what we don't know is how much council support does each councillor have, right? Um, you know, a, a councillor that has two constituency coordinators, uh, you know, could very easily look after 35,000 residents with, uh, you know, without breaking a sweat. Uh, but, you know, one, one councillor doing it and uh, having, uh, you know, sharing a councillor or a council coordinator might not be able to handle that type of workload. So I'm just wondering if we have any further information to sort of frame that uh, that comparator slide that uh, lets us know and the public know just how much uh, you know council support are those individual councillors getting. Thank you. Thank you, Council Blackburn, and, and through the chair to you. Um, thank you for the question. And it is, I would say, when you're looking at comparing apples to apples, it's pretty impossible to do that when you're comparing municipalities to each other, because we all function in very different worlds and different realities and all with very different legislation. So what we have tried to do is provide a comparison that will be used in this situation, a comparison that we will be using when we provide our submission to the NSUARB. 
So mm -hmm. absolutely those factors are in place and those factors need to be considered. And, and we are working with our colleagues to try to provide some of that information. Um, as far as the Nova Scotia Utility Review Board submission that council must do, uh, they've indicated the five factors that they will be considering when they're looking at the, the application, which includes a number mm -hmm. of councillors. So we've heard you loud and clear on this. I think we can take this away and look at providing some supplemental information. Uh, but I also did want to, to provide the, the context of what information yeah. is, is able to be considered by the NSUARB. And while it may not be applicable completely for the application, uh, we don't want to lose the comments and don't want to lose the, the questions. So we, we will take that away. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Uh, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. I, um, I want to echo what uh, Councillor Blackburn said about uh, the comparative. You know, I, I did chat with you earlier, Liam, about uh, the Hamilton numbers and, you know, looking at how we can actually do apples to apples. Um, certainly, uh, you know, the, the responsibility to set council support lies with council. So if council says, OK, UARB is only giving us eight counselors, then obviously we're going to need to hire more people to support us. But at the same time, you know, the residents want to work with their counselor. Um, that is the person who is there to represent them in local government. So, you know, I feel like we're, we're sitting in a gray area here where um, while we talk about um, electoral representation, uh, we have to recognize the elephant in the room and we are servicing all residents all visitors for that matter who come into our municipality, all businesses that are here, if they don't get a vote, um, if they don't live here, but at the same time, we are here to serve them. So, you know, I, I just want to stress the fact that the, the, it really is kind of silly for the UARB to just look at parity um, because it is not a realistic uh, data set to consider the true aspects of representation for our citizens. And on that note, uh, Liam, I, I just want to point out that slide five, I think, needs a rethink because the citizens, the residents, uh, the people who come to regional council meetings and give public presentations or are there to speak through the public hearings, um, they absolutely have direct access. Unlike every other, uh, you know, order of government, provincial and federal, citizens do have direct access. So I do think that that arrow needs to point up to the standing committees, but also to council as well. Um, because, you know, council is local government. We're here on the ground and we hear, we're here to listen. Um, so I just wanted to suggest that slide five just needs a rethink. The other thing that I want to point out is the regional center community uh, council. Those, um, you know, those counselors uh, for District 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, they have twice the amount of representation on community councils, because not only are they sitting on Halifax and West or Dartmouth, um, they are also uh, sitting on the regional center. And so that duplication um, and that sort of power of voice that we see with those downtown urban counselors, I think we need to kind of rethink how we're actually providing adequate and efficient voice to our rural counselors. Um, so I just, just wanted to, to point that out. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes. I'm happy uh, to have the conversations that I've been having from a public consultation perspective, like people are, are interested in the survey, they're commenting, um, but you know, they still don't understand the role of the utility and review board. So I think in our messaging, we need to strengthen the communication of what the role of the utility and review board and why people just don't know why is it up to the utility and review board to determine uh, how many counselors the residents of HRM actually have and what the districts look like and where the boundaries are and so on. Because, you know, technically uh, we're only advising Right, we're just we're just suggesting to the utility and review board, and it's completely up to them. Um, so I just just wanted to stress that point. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and uh, good job, guys. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, I just I wanted to reply to one of the comments, uh, Deputy Mayor Lovelace, through through the chair to yourself. Um, point taken and point agreed with on the role of the NSUARB. 
and appreciate that feedback because I do think what we will look at doing is when we bring this phase one report to executive standing committee in May uh, and as well, and, and primarily we, we have been looking at trying to do a main focus on the UARB role specific to phase two as well. Uh, and I wanna, I wanna make note of that and I wanna thank you for those comments and we'll look at uh, trying to apply that. So thank you for that. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Dago Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Liam, for the um, presentation. It was really good. Um, similar to Councillor Blackburn, the, the slide on the comparatives, and this might be just uh, for my own education and maybe for the communities, but I'm wondering about those comparatives and the rural nature, um, what we're comparing. Um, I absolutely love District 1. Um, but for me to go from one end of district one to another is usually a three and a half hour car drive and then whatever amount of time you need where you're at. Um, so, and, and as the, our deputy mayor said, you know, the residents really want to be in the company of their counselor and uh, have that direct relationship and that really good conversation. I think that's what good representation looks like and feels like, and it's how we should behave. Um, so yeah, so in terms of filling out a little bit more information about um, you know, beyond what is the level of support, but looking at, are we comparing uh, from a geographical nature? I understand the parity. Um, and then that makes really good sense. And so I'm just wondering where the influencer of geography might come in, in terms of the rural nature of some parts of our districts. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't sure, Ian, if you would like to respond to that. Or Liam, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Councillor, and uh, through through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, absolutely, uh, the that's really going to come out in phase two of of the study um, with the geographic size. Uh, one of the um, one of the main uh, comparators, actually, that uh, Ian had mentioned uh, earlier is is geographic size. One of those five factors that the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board looks at. So um, when we get prepared for that, uh, as well, uh, ramping up for, for the public engagement and, and uh, having uh, this led by the, the, the uh, new district boundary resident review panel, uh, geographic uh, size will, will certainly be taken into consideration when we look at moving the, or any potential changes to those physical boundaries. Um, so. Absolutely, uh, and uh, it, it will be. It will certainly be addressed uh, during that time. And Councillor Dagelgam, and just to, we will look at trying to provide some additional information prior to Phase One recommendation that shows the physical uh, district or ward size comparables uh, to that chart that we have. So, um, heard that from from you and Councillor Blackburn, and and we'll provide that provide that information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to proceed with the uh, public participation. And again, for today's Northwest Community Council hearing, uh, one speaker signed up by the deadline. Uh, the deadline was 2 p.m. today, uh, Monday, April uh, 25th. Any member of the public who registered with the clerk's office on this matter would be given five minutes to speak. Uh, when I call your name, you may unmute your mic and begin speaking. Each speaker, uh, you, you are asked to begin by stating your name and the name of your community for the record. Uh, please keep your comments respectful, on topic, and directed to me. Once you've finished your comments and answering any questions of clarification, please leave the Zoom meeting and continue watching the rest of the meeting on the webcast. And there's one uh, speaker for this evening, Kate Sullivan. Hello, hey, uh, Eric. Hello, Chair Russell. Uh, unfortunately, Kate Sullivan's connection was lost and they decided to not participate in the public participation. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for that. Ian, go ahead. Chair sure, Russell, if I may, uh, and you will note in the presentation, there was uh, an acknowledgement that the, not the petition, that the survey closes today. Uh, I do want to put out there that for, for this individual, we will we'll see if there's any correspondence that is to be received, but any individual who would like to complete the survey and is not able to complete it before midnight tonight can contact our office and we will facilitate them getting their information on the survey. 
into the survey prior to the final community council meeting occurring on April 28th. Uh, we need the time to make sure we can do a proper analysis of the data, but we do not want to limit any participation for anyone participating in the phase one public engagement survey. So I did want to very quickly take the opportunity to encourage anyone to reach out to our office if, if they are not able to and, and to explain why the survey was, was being cut off a couple of days prior to the final community council date. Thank you, Ian. And is it correct that they can contact your office by emailing clerks at halifax.ca or by calling 902-490-4210? I'm seeing a thumbs up, so let's uh, thank you very much. Um, let's move ahead with the meeting then. The next item on the agenda is uh, item 13.1.2, commercial uses within Beaverbank, Hammonds Plains and Upper Sackville Municipal Planning Strategy. We do we have a staff presentation? I see Carl Purvis. Good evening, Carl. Do you have a presentation for us this evening? Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair. Yes, I do have one if you uh, would care for one. Uh, we good. are seeing thumbs up. Go ahead. And we can see your screen. Go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and, uh, and Councillors. My name is Carl Purvis. I'm here with, uh, uh, I'm a Planning Applications Program Manager at HRM, here to speak to you today about uh, commercial uses within the Beaver Bank, Hammonds Plains, and Upper Sackville Municipal Planning Strategy, uh, generating from a motion from uh, this community council. So as I mentioned, uh, Com Northwest Community Council on uh, April 12th, 2021 passed a motion requesting a staff report considering amendments to the Beaver Bank, Hammonds Plains, Upper Sackville land use bylaw, specifically the MU1 zoning to, for, uh, to consider additional uses for children beyond daycare and educational uses, and requesting that the report should also consider the creation of new categories of uses within the MU1 zone to allow for businesses supporting uh, children's developmental activities. So just to provide uh, some context in terms of where in this plan area that particular zone is applied, uh, the MU1 zone can be seen on this map in the, uh, in the darker gray. And I realize it's gray on gray might be a little bit more difficult to see, but uh, it's along Beaver Bank Road towards the top of this map uh, going north to south. And then along Lucasville Road, just sort of to the to a little bit lower than that. And then going towards the left of the map along Hammonds Plains Road as well. So as a reminder, uh, our regional plan is sort of the, 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 the guiding document that enables uh, growth and development within the municipality and, and, it, and sets uh, and guides development at a very high level. The community plan or the municipal planning strategy, as we call it, that gets a little bit more detailed and outlines the type and nature of uses or densities. Uh, particularly, uh, particular uses might not be permitted in some areas versus other areas. And then we get on to the land use bylaw, which is informed by both of those other documents. And, and that's the very nuts and bolts document. That's the implementation document. We're no longer we're talking about where we want to grow and where we don't want to grow, but we're talking about specific uses, specific buildings, setbacks, heights, uh, lock coverages, things of that nature. So with regard to uh, the planning uh, policies as they exist, um, uh, there's a lot of lands in this plan designated as mis mixed use. It, it's, a, it's a broad designation, and, and that's reflective of the way this community has, uh, has grown in the past. There's been a mix of residential, commercial, institutional uses, and my understanding is that the community at the time this plan was adopted, they, they were looking to see that continue. Now, that being said, the NPS further classifies these lands into uh, a little bit more specificity of in mixed use A and mixed use B and mixed use C. And then underneath that uh, municipal planning strategy in the, the, the land use bylaw, we have two zones, mixed use one and mixed use two. Um, as the numbers go up, the intensity gets up. So generally what you would find that the intensity of a, of a, of a use, be it the, uh, the, the, the traffic, the, the noise, the light, the smell, the amount of, uh, of, of uh, attraction that it is, it would be higher in a mixed use two than the mixed use one. So the higher the number, the higher the intensity. And the mixed use zone were intended to prov provide a spectrum of allowable uses, differentiating in that intensity and size, depending on where a given property was located. So in terms of, in terms of age specific uses, uh, there's not a whole lot in the plan uh, regarding uses that are meant for children, uses that are meant for seniors, uses that are meant for adults, and, and that's uh, to some extent purposeful. 
Um, the best practice of land use bylaws is to try to regulate the use instead of the user to, to ensure equity amongst residents. Um, but, but in another way to put it is that often the impact is, is, is nil or negligible. Um, so if we are regulating land use and we're talking about regulating land use, we're talking about mitigating the impact of potential uses. And um, to pick an example, if we were to have a um, if we were to have a, a gymnastics facility, I know that this is a this was a recent application, one that one of the councillors here uh, and I have spoke to before. If you were to have a gymnastics facility, um, as a in terms of mitigating the impact of that facility, uh, we're not all that bothered in terms of if it's a facility meant for children, if it's a facility meant for teens, or if there's inspire aspiring Olympians training. In terms of the use, it's going to have very similar impacts, very similar similar traffic flows, similar lights, noise, smells, uh, those types of impacts. Uh, as a general rule in this planning area, uh, commercial uses that are larger than 2,000 square feet either require a rezoning or a development agreement that, that would need to be approved by this council. And uh, those which are less than 2,000 square feet, generally they only require conformance to the zone and to receive a development permit. So there's a bit of a threshold that's in the plan right now. So how are recreation or child focus use is presently allowed? Well, beyond that standard of if you're greater than 2000, largely you require a development agreement or a rezoning, lower than you don't. In addition to that, there's the C2 use of the land use bylaw, and that does permit commercial uses up to a maximum of 5,000 square feet where property has direct access to a collector highway. The MU1 zone also allows institutional uses. So acknowledging that the council motion was not talking about daycares, it, it does have um, allowing daycares, community centers, rec some recreation uses that are as of right, uh, and commercial recreation uses, which is a, a separate animal altogether. Um, and these are very large, potentially impactful uses, uh, primarily, um, like animal or vehicle racing tracks, rifle ranges, marinas, golf course. These are some of the examples that the land use bylaw provides. Those are uses which require a development agreement regardless of the size or scale. And that was a decision that was made at the time by council at the time this plan was adopted in the late 90s, 1999, April of 1999, I believe. So the key policy which informs this requirement, uh, all of these requirements is, is, uh, is P133. And again, this was an explicit decision made by council at the time in 1999. Uh, this policy says that um, it's not the intent that all of these lands be pre-zoned for specific uses. The intent is that council was, uh, would like to have the oversight and a greater degree of control for these uses. So by and large, uh, these commercial uses uh, would only be considered uh, through amendments to the land use bylaw and at certain instances by development agreements so that you can have that control so that you know exactly what it's going to be in the case of development agreement, where the building might be, what sorts of outdoor activities uh, you can have in development agreements, you control the, uh, you have an ability to control the hours of operation. So it seems that council of the day wanted that additional level of oversight. Now, that being said, um, you know, council is absolutely uh, has the ability to change their mind on that and say that may have been appropriate in 1999, but we believe that we would like a little bit more flexibility. Um, so we've got four options within the staff report in terms of ways that council could move forward if they so chose. Uh, option number one is to increase the size threshold of commercial uses that require a rezoning or a development agreement. So uh, we, in looking at nearby uh, plan areas, uh, we have all sorts of different thresholds for the intensity of a commercial use that may trigger a rezoning or a development agreement. I'll, I'll frame it, I'll put it under the general umbrella of requiring a council approval. So council would have the ability to change that 2000 foot uh, square foot threshold. Uh, the range in other plan areas nearby, they, they differentiate between 1500 square feet in one plan area, all the way up to 10,000 square feet in another plan area. And council could direct staff to make a change to a new specific number, or you could direct us to go out and engage with the community to help determine a new threshold. Now, if you were just changing the number in terms of changing, changing 2,000 to 3,000 or 4,000 or a new number of your choosing, that would not require an amendment to the municipal planning strategy. And that, could, uh, that decision could come back to uh, exclusively this community council. Option number two would be to change the size threshold for a certain number of commercial uses. So you could also the, alter the existing 2,000 square foot threshold for a specific list of commercial uses. 
um, uh, this would be suggesting that council might want to retain a higher degree of control over uh, the large, more impactful, like the commercial recreation uses. So the rifle range that I mentioned, uh, I, we don't have a lot of rifle ranges in HRM, but we definitely have some. Um, and perhaps it's of councils uh, the, uh, would like to see their own discretion continue for those particular uses or other uses. Um, so again, council could direct staff to make this change to a specific square footage for a type of a specific type of use. You could direct us to go um, create a new use, uh, or you could direct us to go engage the public to get more information on what the public would like uh, and the types of businesses and commercial operations they would like to see um, um, perhaps uh, easily or done and, uh, and, and, and uh, opened a little bit more easily with, uh, with less process and uh, you know the difference between a permit, which might be a few, we a few weeks or, uh, or, or a month versus a development agreement, which could be uh, 10, 11 months uh, in, in time. Uh, I would note, however, that this type of amendment where a specific list of commercial uses would be exempt from that 2000 square foot threshold, that would in fact require a change to the municipal planning strategy, partly and because of that uh, plan uh, policy that I mentioned uh, just a minute ago. Option number three would be to eliminate the requirement for a rezoning or development agreement altogether and just say, you know what, uh, in this plan area, we're going to allow these commercial uses. Uh, it's not to say that there wouldn't be regulations around those in terms of their size and their locations. It's not to say that all commercial uses would be permitted in every single zone, but council could decide to allow these types of uses without a council process and without a council specific approval. Um, this is uh, similar to what the center plan is doing right now. They're pushing a lot of the uses towards the Ezebright model, where if it's in the zone, uh, rarely is it done that uh, uh, anything would need a, a specific council approval. If the council approves the list of uses once in a zone, it, uh, it approves the uh, application of a zone in any areas that it uh, so desires. And then after that, any application that came in that meet the standards of the zone, it would be approved. However, council wouldn't have the discretion to look at uh, um, uses on a site by site basis. This option number three, this amendment would also require a change to the municipal planning strategy. And option number four, which is one that council always retains, uh, council could choose to take no action and retain their existing policies. And uh, staff would still seek commercial use policy consistency between plan areas through the, uh, the, the, the ongoing plan and bylaw simplification process. This is something that we'll be grappling within our suburban and our rural communities um, just by, by natural progression of evolving as we evolve as a department, as we evolve as a municipality. And eventually we will, we will get on to these, uh, to, to these areas and have a good hard look at where commercial uses are appropriate, what types of commercial uses are of a low enough impact that we could pre-zone for these and what type of uses council would prefer to have some level of oversight on. So uh, at this time, uh, staff would recommend that uh, we, uh, that community council recommend to regional council uh, to proceed with option two. And option two, as you may recall, is uh, altering or creating a basically a specific list of commercial uses, which would require council uh, approval, and for other ones, maybe adding a few more to the uh, to the which we could go straight to the permit. Um, so that would require, in fact, an amendment to the municipal planning strategy. And as such, we would recommend that uh, we go engage the public uh, using the public participation program for the municipal planning strategy amendments as approved by regional council in February twenty seventh of nineteen ninety seven. Uh, Mr. Chair, that uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Carl, for that uh, very informative presentation. We're getting a number of those tonight, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, Deputy Mayor, go ahead. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Yay, Carl. <laughs> we did it. Um, I'm, I just want to say thank you so much for this presentation. I know that, uh, you know, over the last year um, and going through the development agreement uh, with uh, the little gym, which we completed just recently um, and looking at how long it took. Um, you know, there is no fast tracking within uh, the development uh, agreement process. Um, and so I, I, I don't know, I'm just wondering whether or not I just throw the motion on the floor uh, or if anyone else had any questions for clarification, but I'm prepared to just throw the motion on the floor, Mr. Chair. You are the only person who has asked to speak, so go ahead. 
All right, then. I move that Northwest Community Council recommend that Halifax Regional Council 1 direct the Chief Administrative Officer to initiate a process to consider amendments to the Beaver Bank, Hammonds Plains, and Upper Sackville Municipal Planning Strategy and Land Use Bylaw to proceed with Option 2, as outlined within this staff report, to increase the size threshold of commercial use requiring a development agreement, and 2, follow the Public Participation Program for Municipal Planning Strategy amendments as approved by Regional Council on February 27, 1997. Very much, Deputy Mayor. Do we have a seconder? Second. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Wonderful. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Um, so, you know, when when we look at that map uh, that you first showed in your presentation, and by by the way, I will say that I think having these presentations beforehand, uh, before the meeting, is helpful, and even having that up, uh, Mr. Clerk on the website for the public would be really helpful. Um, if we can do that after the fact, that would be great. Um, I, I do note that the map of course is in, the, is in the report, but I do think that there are some pieces in your presentation that are really helpful. Um, but when we look at that map, it's, it's kind of like open season um, because you've got um, you know, whole subdivisions for the most part that are MU. And so you've got lots of uh, home-based businesses, um, all kinds of activities, lots of traffic coming and going throughout those very busy and in some cases dense um, subdivisions. And yet at the same time, um, you know, we have an opportunity where we've got a business who wants to open up in Hammonds Plains and has to wait, you know, 12, 13, 14, or in some cases, you know, more than that, 18 to 24 months before they go through the development agreement process or potentially rezoning or what have you. And what that does, I think, uh, is for this area that's starved for jobs, um, where we're trying to get more employment locally and reduce that commuter traffic so you can live where you work, I think we're kind of spinning our wheels and actually doing ourselves a disservice when we don't open up opportunities um, you know, to, to create jobs where people can live or do live. And so you know, when, when I look at that map, I think about... Um, how, uh, quite honestly, how much um, of our land base is actually open for business. But at the same time, we don't have really a community plan. And, and for Councillor Blackburn and I, we've got a massive area without a real plan. And I, I recognize, yes, this was updated in 1997, but boy, was that a different world right? We, we were living in an extremely intense densification time right now, um, especially along the Hammonds Plains Road and certainly for areas um, in uh, Councilor Black Blackburn's district as well. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, how, uh, how do we actually figure out, you know, that intensity of use when it's actually quite frankly, based on perspectives, both perspectives of staff, perspective of citizens who live there, perspectives of regional councillors, we don't really have a clear criteria in an MU zone. And so my motion uh, from April 2021 clearly indicated that I was looking for the consideration of new categories, and that's not in the report. And I recognize that we don't have these categories, but yet at the same time, we do. We open the door for senior uses, right? For senior housing. Um, but when we think about children's development and the importance of, you know, thinking about commercial recreation outside of amusement parks, outside of, you know, child developmental daycares, um, I do think that we have an opportunity to be a little bit more creative in how we think about this. But I would not want to see a 4,000 square foot um, production center in the middle of Highland Park, for example. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So, you know, I, I think that there is a great opportunity here to listen to residents and see what it is that they want. But at the same time, I'm wondering about the timing of this and the regional plan review and whether or not we actually have an opportunity to rethink this MU zone similar to what we're doing in Upper Hammonds Plains, to be frank, where we know that we have conflict within the allowable uses right now, and we are desperately trying to find a way to mitigate those. And um, so I just wanna, you know, Carl, if you can speak a little bit to the timing of whether or not we should kind of put this on hold for a bit, 
wait for the regional plan review, and then reconsider uh, some of those larger pieces of this, you know, open for business <laughs> zoning that we have in District 13 and 14. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, Councillor, I um, yes, uh, the, there's there's some similarities definitely between the the process that we're ongoing with in Upper Hammonds Plains and this one. Um, the 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 most obvious difference, of course, is that the Upper Hammonds Plains process that we're ongoing, uh, the zone is very open and very permissive. And then here we are, we're 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 saying, well, it it might be a little too narrow. And we need to open it more. So in one case, we're we're closing doors, and in this case, perhaps we're opening them. And it's difficult to find that balance. It absolutely is. I would, um, um, uh, I, I think, I think we as staff we would caution against um, going down the route of 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 age specific uses to say, you know, if I take a use of um, mini golf, for example, let's say that um, as to you know if 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 uh, if it's the, the impact in terms of if there are children there versus there are adults there or there's a blend there, the impact is relatively the same. I mean, people are putting and, and that's that. The real impact is if the use is, for example, one of those indoor ones where it's the shot in the dark and it's enclosed within a building that may be open till nine or 10 at night versus maybe an outdoor mini golf facility that's open till nine or, nine or 10 at night. And maybe they have some music playing outside and speakers and they've got the floodlights on and, and, and those types of uses. So uh, I think that there is absolutely an opportunity to go in in advance of the regional plan or parallel with the regional plan, I might suggest to, to, to have a look at these. I, uh, I wouldn't, I, I, we've got lots to do and I'm, I'm remiss to say, sure, let's go ahead and do it. But that being said, I think that um, I think that the 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 where the regional plan is going to be at much higher level, we're down here in the in the nuts and bolts of of implementation. So if if there is a changed desire by this community council, I would suggest moving forward with a with a motion today to to directing us to do that, and that could be done. Okay, well that's really helpful because I think um, you know there if if we're looking at option two, which I think is the best option, quite frankly, folks, this is this is you know we're looking to change the size. We're not necessarily increasing. We're not necessarily decreasing. We're actually just looking to change, and and maybe that means um, that there's a, a starker difference between MU one and MU two, for example. Um, you know, is that is that something? Uh, it, you know, if we're thinking about MU two, kind of a, a much larger. Uh, area than the MU1. So uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I, um, I, I guess I'm a fan of option two. I appreciate the work that you've done on this, Carl. And um, I think that uh, it would be wise uh, to take a look at this considering how pervasive um, that zone is along that corridor and also, you know, throughout, uh, well, both of our districts. So I'm not sure, Councillor Blackburn, if, uh, if you agree, but um, I'm thinking it's it's time to giddy up and go and have this discussion with community. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Blackburn, I think. Uh, no, I just wanted to uh, just quickly weigh in and say, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly in favor of uh, option two as well. I uh, just want to throw it out there that I, I do believe there are some uh, some planning studies that are taking place right now uh, for uh, the Lucasville Road area. And uh, just uh, just asking that uh, you, you keep that in mind as the process moves uh, moves forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Blackburn. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. That is a really good point, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you for raising that. Because as we look at um, the future phases, phase three, phase four, phase five, um, and thinking about uh, you know that that future development and also potential extension of service boundary and all that kind of thing, you know the um, yeah I think this is actually a good opportunity for us right now uh, to do this uh, in concert with regional plan review. So. Thank you to staff. I'm, I'm also very impressed at how quick you came back with this report. So thanks very much. Appreciate it. We do have some pretty incredible staff. We do. We're so, lucky. Yep. Uh, I see no further speakers in the chat. So are we ready for the question? Question. Question. The question has been called. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 
All opposed say nay. Great, that motion passes. Uh, just as a reminder, Councillor Outfit uh, has had to leave the meeting. The next items on the agenda are uh, members of Community Council. There are four of us, but there are none on the agenda. Um, th then uh, motions, and there is nothing there. There is no in-camera item. Uh, there are no added items. Notices of motion. And not seeing any. Uh, next, we would have public participation. Uh, and uh, we would normally have that, but no speakers have signed up by the deadline. And as a reminder to those watching from home, in order to have signed up, the deadline was 2 p.m. today, April 25th. The date of the next meeting of Northwest Community Council is May 16th, 2022. And so could I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Thank you very much, Councillor Dago Gammon. We stand adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. And, and again, thank you to staff for all of your support. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thanks, everyone. Have good a good night. night. Have a, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.